And risk management is very important because of volatility in the marketplace. As we become a global marketplace as producers and consumers, uh, and also the uh, more uh, erratic nature of politics and business and macroeconomics worldwide and the interconnectedness of countries worldwide, it's increased volatility. Also, uh, the amount of money that's in the equities market and in the, in the commodities market and the way that, that money shifts back and forth in rapid ways makes it, uh, creates a lot of uncertainty for farmers. And so daily they have to deal with issues that really don't connect directly back to the farm. And so risk management practices and risk management tools help them deal with those radical unknowns. from the lending side of it, in that they work with their lenders, uh, look at the amount of coverage that maybe is necessary to back up their, uh, their financing. But in addition to that, you know, it provides a base level of support during adversity. And so things what we do in risk management supplement that to help cover uh, those, those quantities of production above what might be covered by crop insurance. So crop insurance practices, risk management practices in the marketplace really kind of go hand in hand to keep the farm sustainable. We may have someone that attends one of our hedging workshops annually for quite a number of years and they tell me that it's just not something that comes natural and that it's really very good to come back in and get a refresher and stay on top of the terminology and be refreshed on the different tools and for the fact you know just like with the farm bill or crop insurance or risk management every year is slightly different and so there's different circumstances that may have someone buy up a certain level of crop insurance in a given year or approach the marketplace with cash sales or options in a given year. So but due to our weather, due to the, what we talked about in the uncertainty in the, in the global marketplace, every year can be just different enough that I think that, that uh, it keeps uh, farmers, producers uh, yearning for new and fresh information. Okay, so, so we think of crop of uh, farm policy of being a stool with three legs. And one of the legs is the Title I, whether we used to be uh, deficiency payments a long time ago, or now we have ARC and PLC. So that's one leg of the stool. Another leg of the stool was the loan programs, either marketing loans or LDPs. And, and that was kind of, there had been a time where that was really important. With now, with a little bit higher prices and the right, loan rates have been low, it's, they're less important, but it's still part of the stool. The third part, and, and probably emerging as one of the most important parts of the stool, is, is crop insurance. And, and so when I talk about the, the safety net, it is all of that together. And, and people ask all the time, well, why don't we just put all the money in one? I think, I think as we go forward, crop insurance, as we get new products and new innovations, and that's one of the things that I mentioned in the talks today was that most of the Title I programs, the commodity programs, they don't, they kind of, that whole, they evolve over time. They don't really change very much because there's only so many ways you can provide support. And, and one is base acres and one is yields, program yields. And so there, there's just a, there's not a whole lot of innovation there. There's a lot of innovation on the crop insurance side. Uh, we went from yield products to revenue products, and now we're using uh, yield exclusion, which is a tiny part of the last farm bill that nobody even talk, talked about, but it has, it's, it's a big deal for producers, especially in the Southwest. And then now with uh, uh, enterprise units, it's made it where uh, farmers can really uh, increase the level of coverage and, and not have to take as much risk on their operation. It was put together originally to address a specific problem, which was the crop failure in Kansas, the 89 wheat crop. Uh, there were counties that were near zero yield, not individual farmers, but counties near zero yield. 
worst wheat crop ever and still is. At that time, uh, farmers were expecting a dollar or more in the um, government payment, um, which we called deficiency payments. It's very similar to um, the price loss coverage payment now, uh, just a different strike price. Uh, at that time, it was $4 for wheat. It, that number is $5.50 today, but same principle. Um, and so they lost that dollar payment that they expected, dollar a bushel, um, and the price, because the price went up and they didn't have any yield to, to sell. And the standard crop insurance contract doesn't cover that. Uh, the yield protection contract that we still sell doesn't cover that either. Uh, so that's where the original idea behind yield replacement came from. If you remember back in, in uh, 2012 uh, time frame, we had corn prices on the board get all the way to eight bucks. You could have actually sold three years out, they trade corn that far out, and been fully hedged because with the our, the replacement contract, which we call revenue protection, it's a yield replacement contract. When you get out to those second and third years, you will either have the bushels to offset that hedged position, or you'll have enough insurance dollars to actually replace the bushels and offset that hedged position. So either way, you're fully hedged going forward. I guess I should add the caveat, as long as you don't sell more than the guaranteed bushels. Few farmers do, although I wouldn't necessarily say they shouldn't. It gives you a put that's much cheaper than a put that's traded on the board. Um, the thing about the put, oh, it's a derivative. And in order to lower the cost of the insurance, this was a decision that was made 20 years ago, uh, it was decided we needed some way to lower the premium cost and the way that was done it said well if you have a price loss rather than paying the full value of a put you'd pay the full value of the put and then you would deduct from it any dollars that uh, were provided because your actual bushels exceeded the guarantee so once the bushels exceed the guarantee then that put starts to take on negative values. A traded put never takes on trade, uh, negative values, but because it takes on negative values, the price can go high enough to actually eliminate the payment, period. Um, and that really separates it from the traded option, and that's why this put is so much cheaper than a traded option. It's not because of subsidy, it's because in the scenario where you're, um, uh, you have higher yields, it can actually eliminate the put. Um, you can always produce your way out of a loss. You have revenue protection, which is RP, you have yield protection, which is YP. And on those two policies, the big difference is uh, yield protection protects only yield. You come in with a fixed price, and no matter what happens to the futures price during the year, that base price you get in the spring is what your loss would be settled on if you had a, if you had a yield loss. RP incorporates both yield and price, so you're actually insuring a revenue, not a given yield or given price. You're insuring a revenue, which is what you get by multiplying the price times the yield. So. The way the RP product is built has two options. You have the base, which means if the harvest price goes up during the year, then you get to take advantage of that. Uh, they reset the price in what they call the harvest period, depends where you're at in the country on which month that's going to be. But that harvest price, if it's higher than the base price, you get to use that. So if you had a yield loss, the prices went up, you're still going to get paid at the higher price because that yield loss is going to be now, multiple, your ending bushels are going to be multiplied by that higher price, so you get to take advantage of that. Uh, conversely, if prices fall, you may still produce a crop, but your revenue may be lower because you are right at your guarantee, but with a lower price, you're going to be less than what your base revenue was back in the spring. 
and the, so that RP product will pay that difference. Uh, now there's an option uh, you can get on RP, which is uh, you exclude the harvest price option, and what happens there is you don't get to take advantage of that higher price. Uh, if the market ran up and you had whatever bushels you had, they're going to be they're going to be valued at the higher price, but your base revenue didn't change. And that's the big difference is you give up that ability to uh, have a higher price if you exclude the harvest price. As this name implies, it covers all the crops on the farm. So it's not just tied to a specific crop. So, you know, regular crop insurance RPYP is tied to a specific crop. So wheat has a policy, sorghum has a policy, cotton has a policy, corn has a policy. On whole farm, all those are aggregated together and you're looking at versus Schedule F revenue. In other words, like when you file your taxes, you have a Schedule F return. They're comparing your revenue that year off the farm to, the, to your guarantee, which is based off your Schedule F. So that's the difference. Now you can still have individual crops covered in a whole farm scenario and they give you a discount if you do that. Uh, if you carry whole farm and individual crop policies at the same time. But the key for whole farm to trigger would be your revenue would have to be lower than your Schedule F revenue that if they use an average of that and then you buy a coverage level on that like you would any other crop. PCI is very similar to Whole Farm. Uh, it's a private product, uh, again, based off <clears throat> your Schedule F return. Uh, interesting thing about PCI is if your input costs increase during the year and you've put on more than you have in the past, your guarantee also slides up. So that's why it's called production cost insurance because it helps cover some increasing production cost, where Whole Farm does not do that. Uh, but again, very similar if they're based off your Schedule F revenue, that's what they use to determine if you have a loss.